Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever it is that you are tuning in to watch this service, um, we're thrilled that you have tuned in, and we hope that um, today, um, at this service here at Yorkville Congregational United Church of Christ, that you will find something that will feed your soul and nourish your spirit today. Um, today is the first Sunday of the month, and it is also um, Trinity Sunday, um, the day when we celebrate our triune God. And um, it is also Communion Sunday, so um, if you did not get the email telling everybody that we were going to be celebrating Communion today as part of our service, you can pause the service and um, run out and get your bread or, and your wine or your grape juice ready so that um, you can be ready for Communion when we come to that part of our service. So I want to greet you in the name of the God who created you, the Christ who redeemed you, and the Holy Spirit. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. The call, the order for worship is um, available on Google Docs, and um, there's a link on the website, and I believe it's also available on Facebook. So um, if you want to get that as well, pause this to get that so that you can join in the call to worship and our other prayers, please do that now. So let us begin to worship our God with our call to worship. Let us bless the Lord. Pray the works of the Lord. The earth is wonderfully made. The seas, plants, animal life, and all good things. Let our praise and meditation be pleasing to the Lord, our God, and our Creator. Renew our spirits and fill our hearts with the peace of Christ. By your Spirit's power, O Lord, bring us healing and joy. Bless, Bless the, the Lord, Lord, O my, my soul. soul. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. join in our prayer of confession. Holy God, we confess to knowing more about how you would have us be than actually being that way. We confess to professing more in our statements of faith than we make manifest in our living. So we come and confess our ambivalence, our confusion, our frustration, and our apathy about the discrepancy between what we believe and what we do. We confess to justifying our compromises, but we also confess to trusting you in and through our failures. We confess to clinging to your grace. Most of all, we confess our deepest gratitude for your grace in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. God has heard the confessions of our hearts and our mouths, and because God has loved us, God loves us now, and God will always love us, we are forgiven. Traditionally in our service, this is the time when we pass the peace of Christ to each other. Since you are not all here, we cannot do that, but I will pass along the peace of Christ to you through this video. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and in the entire week to come. We don't have any real announcements this week. Tina, are you going to be doing a, a hymn sing anytime soon? Yeah, I, yes, I need to find a calendar and get that. Okay, yeah. so there, there will be another hymn sing coming up soon. Um, Wendy uh, Walker is with us today as part of our service, and she will be singing our closing song. Um, so um, that's a joy to share. Um, we also want to um, continue to pray for all the medical people and first responders on the front lines. We want to pray for the people all, all over the world who are infected with COVID-19 and struggling to survive and those who are battling any illness. Um, we want to pray for those who are facing surgery um, and those who are recovering from surgery. Jim Davis's brother actually um, today, uh, Saturday, but um, 
it'll be tomorrow to you, or yesterday to you, um, was having surgery for a um, perforated bowel. So please keep Barry Leggett, Jim's brother, in your prayers. Um, we also want to pray for all those who have lost loved ones during this difficult time, especially those who have lost children or grandchildren. We want to pray for Lori Houle's dad, who is now in hospice care. Um, we want to pray for Tina's dad, who has been hospitalized a couple of times during the last couple of weeks. Um, he is home now and is doing better, but um, please keep him in your prayers as he continues um, to improve. Um, and we also want to pray for all those who are struggling with finances in this difficult time, as well as those who are struggling with emotional issues, as many are still being um, staying safe and staying home. Uh, we want to celebrate all those who are recovering from any illness. We want to celebrate our state moving to the next phase of opening back up. And um, we again want to celebrate and give thanks for all the unselfish people in so many places and so many professions who are helping others to um, live through and survive um, this pandemic. So let us be in a spirit of prayer together. Gracious God, we are an impatient people filled with a multitude of desires and needs. We long for simple things, the end of this whole virus mess, being able to again gather with friends and family, and a desire to return to our normal work routines. We have desires that are more complex too, that our national leaders would show more concern for and work for the common good of all Americans. We desire that the nations of the world would cooperate in all things as they seem to be in managing this virus. We want to end war forever. We want an end to racism and the acts of injustice that it brings with it, the violence that it triggers. And we desire that hunger and poverty would no longer plague any of your children. So we ask, O oh God, that you would pour out your grace this day on each one of us that you remind us of your constant presence with us and that you would replace any despair we feel with the power of love. We pray for those who are ill with the COVID-19 virus and any other illnesses. We pray for those who are in hospice care like Lori's dad. We pray for Tina's dad and any of those folks out there who have been hospitalized or are hospitalized now. And we are praying for Jim's brother and any of those people in our family and friends and in our congregation that are facing surgery or have just come through surgery. We ask for comfort for those who are grieving, especially those who are grieving the loss of a child. We pray for those in nursing homes and prisons. We pray for those who would call, we would call our enemies and ask for the gift of loving and forgiving hearts. We pray for all the small businesses in our community and those who are struggling with trying to pay their bills. And we pray that you would give your divine guidance and wisdom to state and federal leaders that they continue to work through the reopening of our state and this nation's economy. Guide them to do it wisely, with care and concern for every human life and not for the sake of their reelections. We humbly ask for your guidance into the future, God, especially in this time of racial unrest. We pray these all these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, who gave us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is traditionally the time in our service when we would collect the offering. And we want to thank, as I have every other week, all those who are continuing to send in their offerings through the mail or dropping them off here at the church. All those who are e-givers who are continuing to help us pay the bills here um, while we are not gathering together. And... Um, just know that um, if you are someone who is just tuned in and you would like to uh, make an offering to our church, there is a button on our church webpage um, where you can go and you hit the button and it'll take you to a site where you can make an electronic gift to the church today. So thank you for your continued support and um, may God bless your gifts to the work of God. <laughs>
you join me in our unison prayer of dedication of gifts and self. Loving God, we thank you for all you have given us. Use these offerings that we return to you to accomplish the ongoing renewal of your creation and the growth of your kingdom on earth. Bless your churches everywhere and empower those in diverse ministries of teaching, healing, proclaiming, organizing, nurturing, feeding, counseling, and befriending. May all that we have, both abilities and resources, be used to serve you and our neighbors for the common good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We have one scripture reading for this morning. It comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. Would you all please be in the spirit of prayer with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every heart that will hear this today be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I know that you know that I know that I can't see you, but go with me on this, okay? How many of you know what a koan is? Raise your hands. A koan? Oh, I thought for sure Tina would know what a koan was. I see that there are a few of you out there who do know what a koan is. But for those who don't, according to Webster's online dictionary, a koan is a paradoxical antidote or riddle used in Zen Buddhism to demonstrate the inadequacy of logical reasoning and to provoke enlightenment. Zen students have said that as they have contemplated a koan, they have discovered a level of reality that looks far beyond reason. One famous Zen koan is, when you can do nothing, what can you do? Another is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? We Christians have some koans of our own. Many of Jesus' parables are koans, as are sayings like, those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and then he told his disciples, you are the light of the world. Jesus used teachings like this to bring enlightenment to his students because they were the ones who were going to be going into the world to enlighten others. But perhaps the toughest koan of our Christian faith is not something that was said by Jesus, but a question about Jesus. It's the question of his status in the Godhead. In other words, the question of the Christian Trinity. Why does one God need three names? How does one God inhabit three forms? How can God be both three and one? In John 16, Jesus said, Now I am going to the one who sent me. Then in chapter 17, he said, All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Finally, in chapter 20, he said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go, I will send another to you. Who the heck are all these people? How can God the Father be his own son? And if Jesus is God, then who is Jesus talking about? And where does the Holy Spirit come in? Is that the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Jesus or another being altogether? If they are all one, then why do they come and go at different times? And how can one of them send along another one of them? It's all very confusing, isn't it? But trust me on this. No Christian completely understands this concept. Yet we accept the concept of the Trinity as sincere human effort to describe something that cannot be described, that being the nature of God. I sometimes think we'd be better off if we just left the whole subject of God's nature alone. However, if you've ever looked up in a night sky full of stars, then you know how difficult it is to do that. 
you begin to think things like, what's really out there? And how did all this come to be? And does it all end somewhere? Then you wonder who made it all and where a speck of dust like yourself fits into the whole picture. After a while, you start to try to put some answers together before you finally give up and go inside to do something that is far more understandable, like turn on the TV. Someone once said that when human beings try to describe God, it's like a bunch of cattle trying to describe a ballet. We simply don't have the equipment to understand something so utterly beyond us, but that's never stopped us from trying. We turn to the Bible and read the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. Well, that's not really very helpful. Then we try the New Testament. John, the writer of Revelation, in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, tells us, At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne, with one seated on the throne. And the one seated on the throne there looks like jasper and carnelian, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Well, that sure makes everything a lot clearer. Not. What we learn from all this is that throughout the centuries, Believers have tried to describe God, but very few have been satisfied with their descriptions. And very few have done it in a way that's really completely understandable. Words turn out to be too frail to do the job. So we end up doing one of two things. We begin to believe that we really know nothing about God at all, as though nothing about God has ever been disclosed. But that is to deny the historical existence of Jesus, the Son of God. Or we begin to believe that we have the character of God fully captured and domesticated in all of our familiar formulations. But that is to believe that the words of our historic creeds actually say all there is to say and know about God. Our words can't paint a true portrait of our God because creatures can't capture the full nature of their creator any better than a bunch of cattle can dance Swan Lake. The best any of us has been, ever been able to do is to describe what the experience of God is like. What it sounds like. What it feels like. What it reminds us of and how we're different because of it. Whether the experience originates in the pages of scripture or in the events of our own lives, the best any of us have ever been able to do is to simply confess what it's like when we are in the presence of God. And that experience is rarely the same, even for the same person. Some days God feels like a shepherd, fending off our enemies and carefully protecting us. Some days God sounds like a whirlwind, one that blows away all of our certainties. Other days God seems to be a mother hen who hides us in the shelter of her wings. Some days God reminds us of an exquisitely dazzling butterfly alighting somewhere in our view. Other days, God reminds us of a silent helper, giving a boost to whatever project we've got going. If we were to name all the ways that we experience God, the list would go on forever. God the teacher, God the helper, God the challenger, God the servant, God the stranger, God the lover, even God the adversary. When God came to us as the Son, the one that we know as Jesus, the one we call Christ the Incarnate, God didn't say, Call me by my proper name, Trinity. No, we did that on the basis of our experience of God as complex, multifaceted, mysterious, and yet ever flowing with love as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Christians just naturally started speaking of God as Trinity because we experience God in these three ways and many more. And although this is the same God that folks previously experienced as the creator of the world, the father of Israel, we now experience God in the flesh as the Son, and as the power flowing from God that we name the Holy Spirit. St. Augustine, perhaps the greatest theologian during the first thousand years of Christian history, proposed seven things about God. One, 
the Father is God. Two, the Son is God. Three, the Holy Spirit is God. Four, the Son is not the Father. Five, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. Six, the Holy Spirit is not the Son. And finally, seven, there is only one God. When the doctrine of the Trinity was thoroughly debated and deliberated in the third century after Christ, church leaders spoke of God's three persons. Now, in our language today, that sounds like we're talking about three different people. <clears throat> but no, the folks at the Council of Nicaea were building upon images known in the world at the time. Greek drama was pervasive in that time and place. And in Greek drama, one actor would portray a number of different characters in the same play by simply going off the stage and putting on another mask, a mask which was known as a persona. They would then return to the stage as another character. One actor playing three different roles would prompt three different responses from the other characters and from the audience as well. Similarly, you may be someone who plays three roles in your own life. For example, son, father, and husband. You're all those roles, <clears throat> and yet you're only one of them at a time. Otherwise, your family would get a little confused, and you might even be labeled a schizophrenic. Here's another way of looking at it. Consider the statement, I love myself. According to Jesus, it is important to love ourselves, for we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, and if we're not loving ourselves, then it's hard to know how to love our neighbors. When we say, I love myself, we're speaking in a triune way. When I say I love myself, there is a lover who is doing the loving, namely me. There is also the beloved, the object of my love, which is also me. And there is the loving, the act and the energy of the lover upon the beloved. So even with one person, there is the lover, the beloved, and the act of loving. Augustine used this example to affirm that reality itself is Trinitarian. Another theologian said that when we talk about Trinity, we must forget how to count. At first glance, the Trinity is a mathematical impossibility because one plus one plus one never equals one in conventional math. That's why we need to use a different kind of logic. It took Augustine 15 books to describe that other kind of logic, and even then, he only touched on the edges. The problem with Trinity is not that it's a bunch of nonsense, but that God is God, and we are not. We're just people, the people God created. Some folks describe the Trinity as being like a three-leaf clover, one plant with three leaves. Others point to water in its three incarnations, liquid, ice, and steam. Yet even these aren't fully accurate because God is mystery and the Trinity helps us to see that truth. The Christian faith statement about God as three in one is our confession that God comes to us in all kinds of ways as different from one another as they can be, and yet it is not many gods who come to us, but the one true God. Now you may be wondering, why is Pastor Mark preaching on this today, and why is this important? Well, first of all, it's Trinity Sunday. And it's important because more and more these days, Christians are being challenged by people in other faiths about what it is that we believe and what's the nature of the God that we believe in. For example, Jewish and Islamist folks believe that Christians blaspheme when we add Jesus to the Godhead mix. New Agers and spiritualists consider that Christians are spiritually unevolved because we believe in a God who is far more than a spirit of good floating around in the world. In today's text, when Jesus gave the Great Commission to his followers to go and share the good news, he didn't say, do it in the name of God or do it in the name of me. He said, do it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what the folks at the Council of Nicaea focused on as they were trying to put into the words the nature of the God they believed in. It's also important for us because even among Christians, 
Our language falters and our misunderstanding and thus our judgment of each other increases because we tend to highlight different aspects of God, like that one particular aspect is all there is to God. Let me give you an example. Many mainline Christians, and we in the UCC are considered mainline Christians, focus on the sovereignty of God, the creator of all, the intimate nature of the person of Jesus Christ and the touchy-feely spirit guiding people's lives sometimes gives them us the spiritual heebie-jeebies. More fundamentalist Christians focus on the work of Jesus Christ as the savior of the world, and they talk in Jesus and Christ terms almost to the point of making an idol out of Jesus. And others focus on the spiritual awakening aspect of Christianity to the point that other Christians wonder if they have lost their grounding in the incarnation of Jesus. Maybe the truest message about the concept of the Trinity is that in believing it, we touch the edge of mystery, hunting for something closer to experience and enlightenment than understanding. Just as the Zen Buddhist contemplates the question, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Perhaps we Christians might draw closer to the mystery of our God if we were to ponder the question, what is the sound of three hands clapping? Amen. And now we come to this part of our service where we gather together around the table that Christ set for us and invites us all to. This table is open to all who wish to know the presence of the Christ in the sim uh, symbolized in this humble act of sharing. Come not because you must, but because you may. It is spread for you and me that we might know that God has come to us, shared our common lot, and invites us all to be God's people in Christ. No matter what your race, your creed, your gender, or your orientation, all are welcome here at this table. This is the table of grace. Come to this table just as you are. The cup is never empty and the plate is always full. The symbolic elements of bread that sustains life and wine reminiscent of Jesus' first miracle reveal God's unfailing provision for us in body and in spirit. As we surround this table, let us remember that Jesus' healing power is at work today in the word, in the bread, in the wine, and in the silence. This is the joyful feast for the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and gather around Christ's table, partake and be made whole. Would you join me in our unison prayer of consecration? Loving God, we take these common elements made from grain and grapes and set them aside for this symbolic and holy purpose consecrated by you and confirmed by the faith in our hearts. Amen. On that evening when Jesus gathered his final evening with his friends at the final Passover meal, he would share with them. When the meal was over, he took bread and he broke it and he said to them, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat of this, remember me. And likewise, he took the cup and he filled it and he blessed it. And he said to them, this is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, remember me. Partake and be made whole. And now would you all join me in our unison prayer of thanksgiving. God, we thank you for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of the living Christ, and we've received all of Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith and increase our love for one another. Go with us to the streets, to our homes, and to our places of work and play, so that we might carry your amazing grace in the light of Christ's love and forgiveness into the dark places of our world. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Wendy. That was gorgeous. And um, one of the reasons we never walk alone is because it is within the power and the mystery of our triune God to come to us wherever we are in a form that will help us know that we are in God's presence. So, may the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God, and the power and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you not only today, but in all the days to come. Amen.